great. Okay. Yeah. So welcome back. Uh, this is the second of four talks. Um, last one for today. Uh, I realized based on the last question from the last session, somebody asked, how unique is this to humans? Um, and I realized that even though I entitled this talk, Human Genetics One, there are very few human examples. Uh, <laughs> uh, but just to give you a little bit of background on, on kind of where we're going to go with this talk, we're going to quickly review meiosis and genetic variation since we talked about that before lunch. And then we're going to get into haplotypes and LD, just kind of basic intuitive definitions of what those things are about. And then we're going to start talking about Mendelian inheritance. And this is not necessarily super important for what we're doing here at the Summer Institute, but I think it's an important perspective to have as this is also in part a history of science kind of concept. That for a long time, this is really what people thought of as genetics. I think uh, Tammy and Ravel and myself are talking about this in the car on the way up here, that Mendelian inheritance is often what people learn in high school to be genetics. And so when we're thinking about genetics through this lens, um, it can certainly color the way people think about it and what they end up concluding from anything you say to them. Um, we'll go through some of the really common classical examples from there. This will probably at least look familiar from, from high school and from undergraduate. And then we'll sort of introduce what makes complex traits different. And then that'll be it for today. So uh, we had this just before lunch, so this is going to be a super quick review. Uh, we have, oh, and it is still totally cool to interrupt me whenever you would like. Um, so before lunch, we talked about meiosis, and it has two steps. The first step is where the chromosomes are replicated just like in mitosis, but they also undergo crossing over so that the person who's forming the gametes, their maternal and paternal genetic material is now getting scrambled in a way that doesn't lose functional information, but does make it get mixed up. Um, and this is a, a close up of that. And then we had some words about that. I won't read them to you. Um, and then this is the larger schematic of producing sperm and eggs. So we talked about germline mis uh, mistakes or, or miscopyings, mutations, um, also known as variants, uh, being de novo the first time they occur, but then after they occur, um, they become fixed in the in the offspring, and then these are are inherited mutations that we're always talking about. So, just to refresh, we talked about SNPs being one base to another. We talked about indels being either the addition or the subtraction of some small number of bases. These are usually pretty small in the modern uh, modern way of annotating them. We also talked about copy number variants, which you could certainly think of as, as an insertion, but it's usually just a repetitive piece of DNA that's in there a whole, whole bunch of times. Often trinucleotide repeats are pretty, pretty common. And we talked about um, trisomies or unisomies where you have a whole extra copy of a chromosome um, and how these are relatively rare. So we talked about, we had this, this pedigree, and we talked about how if a de novo mutation occurs in the germline of this person, um, that there might be many of their subsequent offspring that might bear that mutation, and this is how uh, we think about genetic diversity, especially among related individuals today. Um, Talked about human history, realized we didn't know what this dotted line meant exactly. Um, so the, this, this kind of sets us up nicely to talk about this idea of a haplotype. So a haplotype is a set of DNA variations or polymorphisms that tend to be inherited together. So a haplotype can refer to a combination of alleles or to a set of single nucleotide polymorphisms. I'm just going to call them SNPs from now on instead of having to say that whole mouthful. Um, and they're found on the same chromosome, usually right in a row. So because this process of recombination happens at similar genetic locations, and we talked a little bit in the last section about how it's, it's not as hard and fast as this one spot is a hot spot, but that certain regions are more likely or less likely to have recombination. Um, this will lead to large pieces of DNA being inherited through many generations, and all of the variations that have accumulated on that segment are going to be inherited together. 
as mutations occur, um, they're going to occur on a background of some existing mutations. And so this is, this is how we think about new haplotypes um, arising. So common variants tend to, um, to be some combination of older and, and more benign, and, and rarer variants tend to be either newer or, or more pathogenic. Um, and therefore subject to natural selection, just kind of, as we always are, are talking about this trade-off between like common variation, which is often useful for the kind of work we do, but not necessarily phenotypically meaningful. Uh, all right, so what is a haplotype? I think this picture is probably more illustrative than the previous slide with a lot of words on it. Um, but if this is the reference human sequence, and the reference sequence, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the Human Genome Project and how that all went down. But this is just one guy um, to start with. It, it was one individual from Buffalo, New York, who happened to produce really high DNA quality um, in the first assay that they did. And so he, he, was, the, he was a volunteer. Um, and so sometimes the reference sequence is, is, not, is not reference other than it is the first person who was sequenced. Um, the reference has since been updated to include other patches, but that's just an important thing to keep in mind. Um, and then you might have a number of people in your sample that all have this haplotype together, where they have a couple of SNPs going on here, one little deletion, and then they have uh, an unusual, and then someone has this unusual haplotype that doesn't look like anybody else. Um, and you might have another one that looks a little more like the most common non-consensus haplotype, um, but also a little different. So the idea being that the blue letters are different from this consensus sequence, um, and the red letters are different from each other. Yeah? What about the third one? Because the, the third one looks like it's identical to the top one, except for one. So what about it's unusual? Oh, just the, the this A and this deletion are, are traveling in, in kind of the opposite direction that you would expect from, from everybody else. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I don't understand. <laughs> what, what, uh, so, so you say unusual haplotype one mm -hmm. is, is this person that's identical. So the first row is identical to the third row. This row is identical to this row, except, except for this G. Except for that G. So that's yeah. the unusual thing is that it's just different in one spot? Yep. And then, so the, at least my, the way I would look at this is to say, like, this is probably a newer mutation, and it arose on this background. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, and this is also a newer mutation, or, or mm, that it's it's harder to tell which background this one arose from. Like, probably this, and then this was maybe a back mutation to A. But the. the Kind of, kind of like just by looking at them, you might be able to come up with a story. Grant. This is something that has always sort of been tricky to me. I'm confused about how we make the distinction between what is the background and what is mutating off of that. That is a great question, and I think different algorithms might even give you okay. a different answer. So it, it's strictly computational. It's it's a tool, um, but often, especially if you're looking at like a cross species data, mm -hmm. the background is going to be whatever you've inferred the ancestral okay. sequence to be. So you have to make some assumption about what came first and then everything comes from that to some extent? Like, the, the there are some models that do that. Okay. Um, but, but yeah, it's um, consensus is, is often just relative to the annotation. It, it's not consensus in an evolutionary sense. Okay. Hopefully that's helpful. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, LD. Uh, so obviously we all deal with LD and the kinds of analyses that we do. This is more of an intuitive explanation of what it is and how it comes about. Um, so variants in close physical proximity do not get passed down independently. Um, there could be a recombination event in between them, but most likely there's not going to be. So variants on different chromosomes, by contrast, um, are, are sufficiently far away on the same chromosome, tend not to show this level of correlation. So closer together, more correlated, further apart. Um, less correlated, there are weird exceptions to this every once in a while. Uh, 
not all of which I have a great explanation for. Uh, variants are found together or separately more often than expected under independent segregation are said to have a linkage equal disequilibrium or LD or to be linked is another way people tend to tend to say this and the idea here is just that you would expect you would expect things to segregate completely independently if they had no spatial no you know discernible spatial relationship um, and those are said to be in linkage equilibrium, you almost never hear this term in modern computational genetics. So LD, I'm, I'm sure we've all seen plots that look kind of like this. Um, and this, this is directly related to the conversation that um, Alex and, and Grant kicked off in the last session where we were talking about the, these kind of LD blocks. And that's exactly what you see in linkage equilibrium. So in this heat map, the red cells are highly correlated to one another, um, and the blue cells are anti-correlated, and then the white is, is relatively neutral. Um, and you can see you get, so this is just a pairwise correlation between this position here and, say, this position here. You would find the box uh, that lines up. And, and you get these sort of pyramid structures indicating that these variants tend to be inherited together along with these and that there's there's a little bit of a break in the correlation um, and then you have another block and another block and you can see that these are um, not strict right that there, there's a little bit of pink kind of around the red ones yeah go ahead i just want to confirm that when, when we think of a haplotype we should think of it happening within an LD block not between them yes i i think that's the correct intuition. Yeah. I mean, you could certainly talk about a haplotype that incorporates right. both of them, but then you're just making your life more complicated. Yeah. <laughs> right? Then you just have more alleles to juggle, and why would anybody want that? Um, so you all saw there is a block-like correlation structure. The LD blocks are usually less than 5 kb in length, uh, but they can extend to be very, very large, um, so over 50 kb. I don't have a great sense of why this is, um, but I'm sure there are people working on it. Uh, so LD structure varies based on the population, and specifically the size and age of a population can shorten the haplotype blocks. This is specifically important when we start talking about different different ancestry groups. Uh, so specifically, the population in sub-Saharan Africa is quite old, uh, and that would certainly change when you look at something like Europe or Asia. Recombination hotspots on patterns also vary by population. So just because something is a hotspot in one population that you happen to have data on doesn't necessarily mean that location is going to be the same uh, in another population. Uh, and so those are important sort of provisos to keep in mind. So this is an example of what we were just talking about with the different populations. Uh, this is from a 2006 genomics paper looking at LD structure across different uh, populations. So this is a Korean population, a Japanese population, Han Chinese. Ceph is the Caucasian individuals from Utah from the HATMAP project. Um, and these are the Yoruban individuals, also from HapMap. And so you can see the, just the, just by looking at it, the, these would be different plaids, right? Like if you were looking at, at several different materials, like the, these would not all be cut from the same pattern. And this is the same um, chunk of DNA. I should also mention that these are both measures of LD. They're just two different measures of LD. Um, these are the measures that I'm going to outline on this slide. I'm not going to go through this in, in super gory detail, um, but it's, it's just uh, maybe to mention that, that this is a phenomenon that's been known about for a long time, but how to measure it accurately and most effectively for the kinds of problems that we want to solve um, wasn't immediately obvious. And so one of the first ways that we would quantify this is use the coefficient of disequilibrium, which is to say, how frequently do I observe? So these probabilities, um, I'm just labeling my alleles or my SNPs, if you like, A and B. Um, how often do you see A? How often do you see B? And then how often do you see them together? Are they assorting independently? Or do they t occur together more or less often than you might expect by chance? Um, 
Obviously, the maximum difference of this depends quite a bit on your frequencies. Um, and so somebody proposed a normalization where you divide by the, the maximum possible, possible value. Note this can be negative, right, because you can go in either direction. Um, folks also use the squared coefficient of correlation, which is this R squared. I will let you read and digest the formula uh, yourselves. And so different methods inside of the stat genomic space will use different quantifications of LD. So hmm, the title of this slide, uh, I almost wish I could use parentheses. Like, so I want to talk next about correlation between traits kind of as an idea and also genetics and history <laughs> as an idea, as opposed to the correlation between those two. <laughs> uh, but, but this is this is that kind of history of science component, right? Where we're, we're thinking about how people have thought about genetics historically and, and what that has meant both to the scientists performing the analyses, but also to popular society and how we think about it. And if a lot of this looks similar or to something you've seen in high school, there's probably a good reason for it. Um, was there a hand over here? Okay. Peripheral. Oh, yes, go ahead. So the LD structure. Mm -hmm. um, I understand it differs between populations, but yeah. is it likely that the LD structure also differs within the population across some regions or other minor like uh, subgroups of population? Does that make sense? Uh, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. So let's say like um, you, you are showing like the LD structure for Korean population or Japanese population, yeah. but uh, uh, is it possible to assume like those LD structure differs within the population ah. uh, for those who are like living in a different location, like a uh, west part of, like, I don't know. I see. And then east part of. Yeah. So my question is how, how we can define the population? That, that's a really good question. And because these, these definitions are all correlative, right? Like we have to have a good, we have to have a good handle on how common these variants are and then how common we see them together. Uh, I think we've run into the, so like my suspicion is that there probably is some difference um, geographically even in within whatever we would call a population because let's face it, that's pretty arbitrary um, as far as we're concerned. Uh, but also as your, as your contingent populations get smaller, your, your ability to estimate these things is going to get really bumpy, right? So it's... Kind of the kind of trade yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, th this is this is inspired by both this question and, and also a slide you had uh, this morning. Yeah. Which is to say that um, like the, the African population is so diverse that I remember yeah. Alicia making a comment that we should think of regional differences in Africa as like yes. continental differences in other parts of the world. And I like working with a lot of thousand genomes data recently. I've always been confused by this notion of like an African superpopulation. Presumably, that's like averaging over an immense amount of heterogeneity. And I'm, I'm, like, are people working on kind of making um, like these African LD structures look more? Familiar? I mean, I know Alicia certainly is. Yeah. I, I think she's not part of the Summer Institute this year, uh, but I think her work is still very much following up on that. I know there are institutions that have efforts devoted to increased sequencing in Sub Saharan Africa. Um, venturing an opinion, uh, I think those efforts could be more aggressive. Um, so I think people are working on it. Do you, do you think that we'll come to the point where the, the existing African uh, genomes from a thousand genomes will not be considered useful and like potentially research built on those kind of I, I think they'll always be useful, right? Because we'll always want to use everything. Yeah, I mean, not, not as, in, as in just that it's, it's like 500 samples and that is not I, if I had to venture a guess, I'm, I'm a little nervous since this will be documented for posterity. But, but yeah, yeah, I mean, if I, if I had to guess, yeah, I, I would say that day is coming and perhaps sooner than any of us yeah. realize that they will realize that we were making inferences about a population that was old and diverse uh, based on not nearly enough data. That's a great question. Yeah. I was wondering whether there are like some linkages between like functionality of part of the genome versus 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. Most like That's a really good question. I don't know the answer to it. Oh, yes. So the question is like, you have haplotypes, right? So aren't like these chunks uh, likely to be more functional versus... Because I feel like, okay, like there are variations we see mm -hmm. like between populations. So, so what does that mean? Yeah. Like do certain oh. functional components travel yeah. together? Yeah. And the answer to that is not known by me. So I'm sorry to leave you hanging. All right. Since I think this slide kind of represents a now for something completely different, um, do we have any more LD questions or discussions? Because I know that's probably more relevant to what we're doing here. Cool. OK. Um, yeah. <laughs> Don't be sorry. I mean, I did ask, right? <laughs> So one of the things that has always confused me a little bit, this might be more of an interdisciplinary question, mm -hmm. is the idea of linkage disequilibrium and causal variance and how those are, like a causal variance yeah. will not be an LD with other, or it will be an LD with non-causal variance. Yeah. Is that probabilistically, like, I, I'm a little bit confused by how that works. Like, would there would be a higher odds of something that's causal being in linkage linkage mm -hmm. equilibrium with something else that's causal? Is that possible or like is there only I don't know. Okay. Uh, maybe not the uh, No, this is a great here. question and this is the right <laughs> time to ask it. Uh, I'm sure there will be other moments where we touch on LD uh, and population structure over the course of the two weeks, but this is a great kind of first time to tackle it. So could there be more than one causal variant? Yes. Um, there's, there's nothing biologically stopping you from that. You could imagine if there are two ways of breaking a gene um, and they're on the same haplotype or they're not, um, the gene gets broken either way. They're still causal. Uh, that doesn't happen a whole lot insofar as we know about it. Uh, but it is certainly possible. Um, I think in terms of thinking of causality, Often when we think of the causal variant, we want, we're looking for the thing that truly elicits a biological change. What, whatever biological change we're most interested in, whether it's directly causal of our phenotype or not, um, we're, we're looking for if you could use CRISPR-Cas9 to just have this G, well, we do just have that G by himself. If, if we could just have this deletion without any of these variants, would this cause the phenotype or do we need these guys too? Is, is kind of the, the question that we're trying to tease apart when we start talking about causal variants in that specific context. Um, so in this figure, uh, the idea that you're gonna be in LD with things that are not causal and that you may or may not ca uh, capture the causal variant right away, say that this CT SNP here is in our GWAS, but nothing else in this figure is. And this deletion is the true causal variant. Then this CT is going to light up like, like Dubai uh, kind of plot. Uh, like this CT is going to be really nice and clear. And depending on how much linkage I have across my other SNPs, it might be more like the Empire State Building or something. Uh, but I didn't type this deletion. So that's kind of what we're getting at with that correlation is you can only infer scores from the things you've typed or from the things that you believe you've imputed correctly. And if there's something lurking between them that's in LD and you haven't measured it, you, you, can't, you can't know for sure that it's not the thing that's biological causal. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Any more haplotype LD things? Resounding silence. OK, cool. So I'll leave this for you to read. This is just a little timeline of sort of how, how genomic sciences, as we conceive of it today, has sort of progressed over the last couple of centuries. And as you can see, there, there's a lot of ticks on here. And, and it goes quite back, quite far back, in, in fact, to the 1800s. Um, so I'm actually going to start sort of in the middle of this 
DNA timeline um, and talk about Gregor Mendel, um, who was an Augustinian friar, and he was posthumously recognized as the founder of modern genetics, though you have to remember that this is long before the completion of the Human Genome Project, and so he's, he's not looking at SNP data. He's not um, talking about the kind of genetics that we do today. Um, his first experiments were on inheritance and mostly con conducted in plants. Uh, there are a lot of jokes in the world about Mendel and peas uh, because he used pea plants um, primarily. Um, he designed controls ex controlled experiments to determine how certain traits were inherited from one generation to another. So this is, this is a sort of common illustration of the sorts of experiments that he did where he would take uh, plants with white flowers and plants with red flowers and then cross-pollinate them and, and sort of see what happened. And what he deduced from this is that things like if you took flowers that had been white for several generations and flowers that had been red for several generations and you bred them, you ended up with a generation of all red flowers, um, suggesting that the red pigment was dominant over the white. Um, but then if you took flowers from this generation and crossed them, that you generally ended up with things um, in this kind of three to one ratio. And this is, this is the model that he hypothesized. Um, this is what's in, in kind of the modern literature known as dominance. This is also a very simple, very deterministic way of looking at it. Um, so Mendel introduced several laws in, in his uh, hypotheses about genetics. The first one is the law of dominance, which is if two alleles at a locus different, then one, the dominant allele, determines the organism's appearance, and the other one, or the recessive allele, has noticeable, noticeable effect. We know that this is not true for a lot of traits in the world, but this was true for, say, the color of flowers. Um, he also introduced the law of segregation, which is alleles for a heritable characteristic segregate during gamete formation and end up in different gametes. So this part is meiosis, which we talked about in the previous lecture. Um, and then the law of independent assortment. And this is, this is where LD maybe mucks this up a little bit, or would muck up Mendel's laws. Um, so inheritance of one allele, and hence the trait, is not dependent on the other. Uh, so peas being green or yellow, smooth or wrinkled, flowers being pink or white. Um, and we've already talked about a place where this breaks down, right, where things are spatially located quite close together. Um, so I'm going to show a lot of pedigrees in the next couple of slides that we might as well know how to read them. Um, the squares tend to be male individuals, the circles female. Uh, when we have a bar between them, it indicates a mated pair. When we have a line coming down from the bar, it's an offspring. Uh, two offspring are coming from the same pair, pair of parents. We call them siblings. That's still true. Um, and then you can imagine we could construct complicated pedigrees where we have several generations or <coughs> many, many uh, descendants of the same people, in the same pedigree, or plants. Uh, so if we said that this is a the being shaded in is an affected individual, and an affectation can mean anything from blue eyes to attached earlobes to um, the presence or absence of a given disease. We might color in the pedigree like so, indicating that these individuals are affected by whatever trait it is we're trying to map out. Um, so a locus is a genomic location. We still use that language today. Um, and it can consist of one or many consecutive base pairs. This is one of those words that gets a little bit foggy. If you say locus, some people will be referring to one SNP. Some people will be referring to a broad genetic neighborhood. Um, I prefer to think of this as neighborhood to prevent, and to prevent myself from getting confused. Um, an allele is a variant from a given gene or locus. So an allele can refer to a haplotype of any length or to a single variant. And allele was, is one of these old words you know, from before the structure of DNA was known and, and before we could sequence it. Um, so this is just which version do you have. Humans and mice are diploid, which means we have two possible alleles at each locus. Uh, and there are several classical patterns of inheritance. 
Uh, and if a trait follows one of these, we call it a Mendelian trait. And so we're just going to walk through them really quickly. Um, this is really similar to the diagram with the plants. Um, pea plants are actually diploid, so all of his experiments worked out really nicely, unlike strawberries, which would have been very confusing. <laughs> uh, so lucky for him, he didn't use strawberry plants. Um, so this is what you would call a generation zero, an F0 cross. Um, so if I have, can you guys see the, the differences in colors in the mice? Is it brown on the top? This one's brown and the rest of them are black? No. OK. <laughs> I should have used different colors. I should have had a wild colored mice. It shows up really nicely on my screen for what it's worth. Um, okay. Well, I, I know that you all have access to the files, and hopefully they will show up there as well. Uh, so if you take this first generation cross, and again, this is the brown mouse coming from generations of brown mice and a black mouse coming from generations of black mice, and you cross them, you end up with all black mice. And so this is it's kind of a first generation, and this establishes that the black fur is dominant over the brown fur. If you do what's called an F1 cross, so that's taking two of these guys that were in the middle here and mating them to each other, uh, you end up with four different genotypes. Um, and again, we're just indicating the alleles um, with capital and small letters. This was, this was notation that Mendel used himself, um, and the idea was he tried to always put the dominant trait in the capital letter and then the more recessive trait in the small letter. So when you end up crossing these guys, you end up with kind of three parts black mice and one part brown mice, and these are kind of the inferred genotypes. So you can also do a back cross. Um, these are, these are all words that you might encounter if you're looking at animal studies. Um, they're not used as much anymore. Uh, where you take one of these uh, mice from the first experiment and one of the homozygous recessive mice and cross them, and then you end up with half and half. And all of this is as expected if the capital B allele is dominant over the small b. So in the mouse example, the black coat color exhibits a dominant pattern of inheritance compared to the brown coat color. The big B allele is dominant compared to the little B allele. Uh, and if the allele of interest was brown coat color instead, then we would say the trait is recessive. So dominant recessive is the same thing conceptually. It's just which side of that coin are you interested in. Uh, Example, examples of dominant traits in humans uh, include detached earlobes, tongue rolling, Huntington disease, and polycystic kidney disease. There are many others. I just chose a couple. Alex? I think I read uh, recently that uh, earlobes and tongue rolling are actually complex traits. I would believe it. Yeah. Uh, a lot of what they tell us in, in high school is yeah, actually more complicated. So um, eye color, even. I did 23 me, yeah. yeah. Those recent D was. So on my 23 me, it said I would have uh, the tats earlobes. And they were wrong. Yes. So it's, uh, it's a complex trait. Interesting. I'm curious if they, if they typed the causal variant or, and their imputation is wrong, or if, the, or if it's complex in another way. But that's a conversation for, for later. Uh, OK. So the Mendelian inheritance of dominant traits. So if this wasn't coat color and mice, if this was something that we were interested in, looking at in a pedigree of humans, it would track like this, where if we genotyped everybody, we would be able to infer that everybody who has a big B also has the trait. Easy. So recessive traits are exactly the opposite. Um, so if we have that same cross that we started with, where homozygous mice are the parents, um, we end up with the same exact sort of outcome. Um, we do the back cross, but this time, actually, nothing's different. So we've done the back cross. We still end up with half and half. Um, but this time, we would have, if we're only interested in the brown coat, then the genotypes would look different. Does that make sense? So it, it just depends on, on what we call affected. 
So there are a bunch of examples of uh, recessive diseases in humans, including uh, fragile X syndrome, color blindness, Duchenne mus muscular dystrophy, and hemophilia A. Um, there's a very long list on Google if you start going down that rabbit hole. Um, Mendel also noted in a couple of other examples, this is, I have cows on here, but there are also flowers coming up, um, where if you start with an organism that looks one way and an organism that looks another, that the offspring all have some phenotype in between. So he called this codominance. Uh, another way of looking at this could be um, incomplete dominance, is, is another way that he described a very similar phenomenon, uh, saying that in the first cross, say we have white flowers and we have hot pink flowers, that we might end up with light pink flowers. Um, and so it's more continuous. It's kind of out of precursors of kind of an additive effect idea. Um, so Mendel also uh, hypothesized that sex linkage could be a thing, um, though not, I don't think these were pea plants. Um, so, so far everything we talked about refers to alleles on the autosomes, um, not the sex chromosomes and not the mitochondria. Um, so if an allele for a trait of interest lies on a sex chromosome or a mitochondrial genome, all of this works differently, but it's still completely logical and fairly easy to infer. So mitochondria are super easy, as we talked about in the previous lecture. They are maternally inherited. So if you are looking for a trait that is encoded in the mitochondria, you would expect it to follow the maternal line almost exclusively. Um, here I've, in, I've given the, the mitochondria colors based on their origin. So you can see the red mitochondria just follows the maternal line all the way through. And other relatives with a different maternal line have other mitochondria. Mendelian inheritance, the kind of classical, oh, this isn't even classical. This is Y-linked. Y-linked is exactly the same but the opposite. So it's completely paternally inherited and it's only present in males, right? Because females don't have a Y chromosome. X-linked recessive uh, traits, this is common, the super common sex-linked example that you'll see in high school is get the examples from, from royalty in previous centuries. Um, this is the example that they're all talking about, where if you have something that lives on the X chromosome and it's recessive, you don't see a phenotype when you have two X chromosomes <coughs> because there's a compensatory effect. Um, if you have normal XY, you also don't see an effect, but only males with the affected X are affected and occasionally females, but they have to have two. So the rules of transmission are different depending on the sex of the offspring. Uh, so, so far we've talked about dominance, recessiveness, codominance, and complete dominance, which are very similar. Um, Y-linked, X-dominant, X-linked recessive, and mitochondrial examples. So. These are just the laws. We already read them. We don't have to read them again. Um, but this law of independent assortment, obviously, we already know that that gets gummed up with LD. So from there, the idea of genetic linkage is founded. So again, this is, this is very often in the absence of sequencing data. And this is with fruit flies. Uh, you can see if you have red eyes and long wings, and then another population of flies. The eyes on my screen look kind of gray, but again, the colors don't show up super well. Um, these are supposed to have white eyes on short wings, uh, and if you breed them together, you end up with all flies with red eyes and long wings. Um, you might infer that there is an allele E encoding for eye color, um, and that capital E encodes for red eyes, and little e encodes for white eyes, and then similarly an allele W that encodes for wing length, the big one being the long wings and the little one being the short wings. Uh, and that you would then infer all of these flies to have all of those genotypes. So if we cross this guy to this guy, which is the back cross from the previous example, um, 
you might end up with now starting to get combinations. So if the alleles for eye color and wavelength are sorting independently, you should have these four groups of flies in equal proportion. So you would expect a quarter of them to land here, a quarter of them to land here, and so on. Um, if we did this with an experiment and we, ended, we had a thousand flies at the end of it, um, and this is what we came up with, it doesn't look super equal, right? We, we have more flies that look like the parents. Um, this should be over here. I will fix that. Um, that we can say, these are the, this guy's supposed to have red eyes, is another way you could think about it. Um, that these are the recombinant haplotypes and these are the parental haplotypes. Um, and so how many of each of those do we have? May I advance the slide? Um, and so the idea being that like the number of times you get recombination between the genes, this is meant to be one chromosome and this is meant to be the other. And so we, we know that the big E and the big W tend to track together um, and the little E and the little W and that in in order to get anything that's not parental looking, there must have been a recombination event in here. Um, and so the idea here then became more recombinance means more distance. Like very simple, very linear. Yeah? How would they identify the heterozygotes prior to sequencing? Prior to sequencing, I, I don't know if I'm going to talk about that today, but I do have a slide on it somewhere. Okay. Um, but the short version is that there were microsatellite repeat regions that were much easier to type. Okay, so they were, they were getting something else. Yeah, I mean, this isn't Mendel isn't doing right, this, right. but but like, yeah, prior to Sanger sequencing and SNP chips oh, and all okay. of that, like, like people were looking at genomic variation, but that's very crude, yeah. right? Because you have, to, you have to locate one of those regions, you have to know where it is. Um, and then you have to type it. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, the, like, not in this particular case, but in a general case where the two traits are co-inherited, like, we know that they're not affected by the same allele because each allele is encoding only one protein. That's, that's a really good question. Um, I think that was the way Mendel was thinking about it when... Oh, the question was, how do we are thinking of these, each of these traits as its own allele? How do we know that they're not the same allele? Right? Is that a good representation of your question? Um, that's a really good question. And I guess we don't. Like, they could be, if they always travel together, they could be the result of the same protein. Uh, because Mendel wasn't working on the level of, of genes and proteins, and he was trying to mix up these traits. Um, if he could get them to segregate independently, he called them different alleles. But that's a really good point. Does that clarify your question? <laughs> very little bio background. Like, I actually don't really understand like, if, mm -hmm. if, how a protein could be causing two things like in different parts of the body. So it's like, yeah, I mean, in this case, it, it probably it probably isn't. A lot of these examples, even prior to the flies, like right, like we were looking. Oh, heaven's sake, we're gonna have to go back way too far. Um, a lot of these things involve things like color, and a lot of those proteins are are a little bit simpler, right? It's a pigment. It's it's some protein that has a color, and it's expressed in a particular tissue, and and so. Biologically, that's how that kind of thing would work. Um, so things like hair color and eye color, people tend to use this kind of example for them, even though it's not accurate. Because they'll say, like, well, if you make brown pigment and it's expressed in your eyes, then, then you're likely to have brown eyes. Simple, but like there are many different shades of brown eyes. And it turns out there are actually a lot of pigments that can be expressed or not uh, in humans. Yeah? So in terms of defining eyes, so there seems to be Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in modern times, when we talk about alleles, we're going to be talking about on a SNP chip, this person has the G allele versus the T allele. It's very easily defined. It's it's very rigorous. Um, in this case, he was defining alleles almost by 
um, inferring their existence from the phenotype. But yeah, that's a really good point. But the, this idea of allele and even the word comes from a scientific history that easily predates sequencing and any of these kinds of experiments. Ah, okay, genetic distance. So this is almost old enough that it's not important anymore. Uh, <laughs> but I still think I still think it's useful to to kind of remember that that people did genetics this way for a long time. Um, so in the present day, we just count the bases uh, between one base pair and another uh, if we want to start talking about genetic locations. But prior to the availability of base level sequence data, genetic distance was measured by the number of recombinations you observed between a pair of loci in a v usually as large a sample as you could get. Um, so on average, a centimorgan corresponds to about a million base pairs. Again, this is on average. Um, but LDA makes this conversion really inconsistent and super variable across the, like, across the genome, but it also can be variable across the sexes, uh, which is, has to do with uh, the recombination frequency difference in the sexes that we talked about when we talked about meiosis. Um, so, oh wait, I'm talking about uh, microsatellites today. Okay, um, so this like variable number tandem repeats are VNTRs. Um, and to give you an idea of how long ago this was, um, folks were still doing, but maybe, but certainly not cutting edge um, VNTR experiments. Where is my slide go? Um, when in 2004, 2005, when I was an undergraduate, um, these were still experiments that people would do to validate various hypotheses about what, what genes would do. It was certainly not considered the cutting edge by any stretch, but this was still in use uh, less than 20 years ago. Um, so these are common and highly variable, which allows tracing parental origin. So instead of saying C versus A, we're saying this person has 20 repeats. Um, of this small sequence, someone else might have 10, someone else might have seven, and someone else might have three. And so they're reasonably reliably inherited, and so inferring who people's parents are is really immediately obvious. Yeah. What's the difference between a VNTR and a CNV? That's a great question. Um, I think VNTRs technically could be considered um, a CNV. They're, they're usually really short. Like Either a lot of shorter. They're both usually pretty short. Um, but <laughs> so, so yeah, VNTRs are CNVs. Okay. Um, they're just a very small subset of the CNVs, right? Because these, mm -hmm. these guys have to be super variable. CNVs, sometimes it's one versus two, and that's it. That's the level of the variation. Some people just have one, and some people have like 40? Yeah. Okay. Um, I actually had to do this with real data exactly once. Um, and I, I think the, the variation wasn't quite that large, but it was something on the order of between two or three to like 20 something on the particular one I was looking at. Yeah. I, I may have missed this, but are VNTRs in a specific part of the genome? No, they're kind of randomly distributed, not usually in um, directly encoding regions. Because obviously, if you're very restricted in what your protein can do, if you're just repeating the same sequence over and over again, um, but they they occur with decent frequency. And so, would their distribution be consistent across different people? Like, and go into like this particular part and type just the VNTR? Oh, jeez. Sequence everything to find them. That I don't know, um, but I would guess they probably wouldn't be consistent. That this would be. A very useful tool if you are looking at a small group of people all related to each other. So trying to figure out which offspring inherited which allele of, or, or which copy of which chromosome from which parent, mm -hmm. uh, but not useful for like a population level analysis. So how did they use to, sorry, <laughs> and just, this is really interesting, how did they use to like measure them? How do they use to measure them? That was an assay that I have never run 
So it would be something like looking for the particular sequence and how many times it is? Yeah, so, so ah, they would design okay. like some kind of probe to, to latch onto that sequence and then it was comparing, you know, amount, like, like how much. And then there were algorithms to, to call the number of repeats. Um, that's something I've never touched. So if you did linkage analysis, so this is getting into what um, folks called linkage analysis, and I think one of the recommended kind of supplementary reading books for the course is a, a book called Statistical Analysis, and they actually get into linkage analysis, and uh, that this, this was how folks did genetics for a long time. Um, that in this pedigree, we would aim to test whether the, the 10 copy microsatellite is linked to our affection status, and this could be whatever trait we were trying to study. Um, and you would assume further that our marker is some number of centimorgans from the, the locus affecting affection status. So already here, we, we know that we're not measuring the causal allele. We're, we're just thinking we're measuring something close to it. Um, and the null hypothesis would be that there's no linkage, that these things are um, segregating independently. And the alternative hypothesis is that they are linked at a distance of something that you have to specify ahead of time. And, and yes, you can do this for multiple R's. Um, and so if this was my little bitty pedigree, which is quite small, um, people would compute something called a LOD score. And this is basically just a, a likelihood ratio, just using log 10 instead of um, log 2, as, as you would if you were a statistician. Um, and so in this particular case, um, we would come up with a LOD score that's not very impressive. Um, if we assumed that R was 3. Um, if it turned out later that this person was also affected and that this was not indeed a recombination event, our LOD score would go up quite a bit. Um, just to give you some sense of scale here, LOD scores of 3 or higher were considered significant, but in order to get a significant LOD score, you would need a very large pedigree. Uh, and like, this is this is still a pretty big pedigree to get everybody to participate and get, and get all their markers typed. Um, but this is the era of genetics where you would see these very large multiple generational pedigrees um, in which they collect everyone that they can possibly collect uh, and then do this kind of genotyping and try to compute some kind of score to demonstrate whether or not they've found a location for an interesting locus for a particular trait. Um, so linkage models can be expanded. You can include effects for sex and age and, and penetrance and, and all sorts of things. Uh, but the, these were the, the linkage analysis days. And so penetrance is the one word on that slide that I think we haven't talked about. Um, so some of the traits exhibit inheritance patterns that increase risk in some kind of predictable way, um, but are not deterministic. And so penetrance is this idea of kind of messing with the, the dominance law that Mendel proposed. It says the proportion of individuals that carry a particular allele also ex express the associated trait. So you're, you're kind of assuming some link between them, but you're saying it might not be perfect. It might not be completely deterministic. Um, so in statistical language, if you, the, your probability of being affected, given that you have the, the associated genotype is one, you have complete penetrance. And if you are likely to be, if you have some non-zero, non-one, uh, then your penetrance is incomplete. And this, this is another piece of language that just pops up in the genetics literature every once in a while. Uh, but it's, it's not necessarily a concept that we actively use. So, in order to introduce, um, and I think this is, this is kind of winding down a little bit, um, so complex phenotypes is definitely the land that we all live in. Um, so I haven't technically defined phenotype yet. I'm sure you have all kind of gleaned the definition, but there, there is a definition here just for the sake of completeness. Um, and these phenotypes can be Mendelian inherited. They can involve a single locus, but they can also lo involve many loci, which I'm sure surprises no one in this room, and have an inheritance pattern that's not immediately obvious. And this is where Mendel's laws need a major revamp and how complex genetics differs from Mendelian genetics. And so 
often when folks, especially um, sort of uh, folks that are that are not as genetics literate, um, think of genetics. Often they're thinking of Mendelian genetics, and we are absolutely talking about complex tree genetics. And so this whole um, aside has been about illustrating the, the difference between this kind of classical definition of genetics and uh, where complex trait genetics is is different from it. Um, so these are all the things that we've talked about in this chat. Um, I have a couple of recommendations. Wikipedia is actually really great in this space. Um, Wikipedia is not great for everything, but <laughs> it is really great in, in the science history of genetics department and in a lot of the definitions of these terms. Uh, there are a lot of very enthusiastic contributors to Wikipedia who also work in this space. And so the, the information is quite accurate and easy to find. Um, this is the book that I put in the reading list. Um, it's really meant to be a reference, not light reading in the evening. Um, <laughs> it, it is quite dense, but it has a very nice glossary that contains definitions of all of these terms and will get into very intimate levels of detail on the chemical processes in so far as we understand them. Um, and then this book, Statistical Genetics, which um, is authored by my old post postdoc advisor, Ben Neal, among a, um, an all-star cast, uh, also will walk you through uh, linkage analysis, if that's something you're curious about. And then it also has a really nice treatment of association. And I think that's all I have for you, unless there are more questions. Thank you. Sorry if I missed this. You mentioned that the textbook is available. Oh. I didn't, and I should. Um, so the Summer Institute actually has several copies of the textbook available for you. It's quite expensive. Don't order one from Amazon if you don't have to. Um, but they're, are, are they like sitting out, or do folks have to ask? Um, I'm not sitting out. OK. Uh, they're around somewhere. If, if that's a resource that you would like to use, please. Yeah. <laughs> please track one down um, with one of the organizers. I don't have the slightest clue where they are. Um, but, it, but it can be a very useful reference if there's a particular process that you suspect might be involved or if it's something you just want to know more about. Sorry, one more thing. OK. Um, when, given differences in recombination rates between the sexes, yeah. Um, when we like are downloading an healthy reference panel, is that the pooled sample of men and women? Um, and like, are these differences substantial enough that we should be concerned about? I don't think so. Okay. Um, I, I think it's more of a, a neat fact okay. than okay. Uh, something that you need to adjust for in your analysis. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, well, that's all for me today. Uh, I'll kick things off tomorrow morning with a continuation of this. We'll get into GWAS and association, and then talk about how some of those data are generated. Um, but I think we'll take a break now. Yeah.